Uh, John Englander, I want to get you in on Sandy in particular, you know, the contribution of, of sea level rise to Sandy, and also the notion that you point out in your book is that uh, storms come and go, floods come and go, but sea level rise is permanent, while there's storm surges, but, it, but it's always there. It doesn't just go away. That's right. Even though people are heightened to what could happen by Sandy because it was a dramatic event in a place that you don't typically think of, and it was just coincidental that it happened a week after my book came out and I described that event hitting Atlantic City in New York, which is fortuitous, I guess, in some ways, uh, unfortunate that it happened. But uh, I asked people to dissect it into a couple of different things. Sea level in New York is about a foot higher than it was a century ago, and it's going to rise long term, and it's not going to go down for a thousand years. So that's one line on a graph, if you will. Then it could get worse because of the methane and the melting in Antarctica and Greenland, et cetera, as Angela was just talking about. That's the second component. The third is it was a storm. And storm surge, we're familiar with, whether it be hurricanes or cyclones. Storms are episodic. They're hard to predict in terms of magnitude, um, location, and when. But, and they recede. They, we recover from a storm. Mm -hmm. You don't recover from sea level rise because it won't go down for a 1,000 years. So those are differences, to your point. And then if a storm happens at high tide, or even worse, if it happens at an extreme high tide, a lunar high tide, as happened with Sandy, you have another foot of water on top of the, that for the storm to be based upon. And then we have the two things of the geologic topographic um, um, amplifiers. You have one here in the Bay Area of San Francisco. Uh, New York Harbor is another one for different reasons. There are different geographic, Providence, Rhode Island is another one that I pointed out. So there are different figure, configurations that we don't think of that have the tendency to amplify those storm surge and wave heights. And then there's the built environment. You know, what are the structures we build, the marinas, the seawalls, the things which either um, reflect or deflect a, a wave or perhaps trap it. And people talked about um, could they have built a barrier in New York Harbor to stop the water coming in? And I said they could have, but they'd probably have a heck of a liability because they would have deflected it to New Jersey and it'd be even worse there. And so it's not a simplistic situation when you've got that kind of a global storm surge. So what are the areas that are most vulnerable? You write a lot about Florida and, and is it sandstone or li limestone. Yes. Uh, so what are the areas that where people really ought to be worrying right now? Well, I live in Florida. And while people in South Florida tend to think that it, they'll put up seawalls, that won't do any good, as I explained, because it's porous limestone. And even if you built an impenetrable barrier around Florida or an island, it's just going to come up through the middle of the ground because it's like, a, it's like a solid sponge, if you will, but with pores. So those areas, low-lying areas that are limestone, are particularly vulnerable. But then there are places where the configuration forces water into a bit of a funnel. You have that here in the Bay Area and the South Bay with other vulnerabilities of levees and liquefaction. But uh, Narragansett Bay, any place where there's a bigger body of water that's going into a narrower body, the water's going to pile up. And so that, those are particular places, and they're all over the world, frankly. But it's the, so low, low land, porous rock, and then where you have a structure that funnels water. So what's Florida doing about this? They're starting to get concerned. Um, <laughs> and it's different than out here, because here you have many state, local agencies, and groups that are looking at what do we do. But the Bay Area will be here 200 years from now. It'll look different. There will be some things that have changed, some adaptations. Could be some amazing engineering exercises, but you have enough relief here of elevation that you're going to be here. Miami won't be there 200 years from now. There's no way. I mean, it's six feet high, and you, it's just, it's going to be an underwater. There may be a little island left. It'll be like the northernmost island in the Florida Keys, but as opposed to part of the mainland, but people are starting to, starting to think about that, and it's just starting. If Miami is 3 million people today, and maybe we'll peak at 4 million by mid-century, I think it'll be three or 400,000 people living on houseboats and stilt homes and things like that a century or two from now. So, so it's a different future. Miami becomes Sausalito. That's what's going to happen. I yeah. guess so. <laughs> Uh, there's a part in your book where you talk to people, you're at a cocktail party, and you say you're writing a book on sea level rise, and someone, people lean over to you and say, what do they say? How long do I have? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they do it quietly. They don't want others to know. It's, it, was, I, it happened to me repeatedly 
every time somebody said, oh, John's writing a book about sea level rise, it's like, psst, you know, how long do we have? How long do we have? <laughs> well, when, when, if I sell within a decade, you write that. If I sell yeah. within a decade, I'll be okay, right? I'll keep my, con my beachfront condo for 10 <laughs> years. I'll get out before people realize I'll be all right. I think generally that's true, but the truth is I try to be totally honest about it. We can give you an estimate of sea level's linear growth or curve. We can talk about the catastrophic things, which could happen over a decade but haven't happened yet, although methane's starting. But then there's storm surge, as we saw with Sandy. We've got to add that on top. And when that hits at a high tide. So the truth is there is no year or answer because of those variables, just those four. But this is a problem that's going to get worse and worse by decade. That's all I can tell you, okay, for sure. And it will get worse for the next centuries. I can also prove that to you because the heat is in the ocean already. And there are some things happening in Florida. There's a couple of uh, Republican congressmen who've introduced uh, uh, a law which is called the, uh, the Homeowners Defense Act or something. It's called dubbed the Beach House Bailout, which basically they're trying to position the federal government so that if there's a shortfall in the state funds, if San something like Sandy hits Florida, that the federal government is on the hook, uh, sort of a, a promissory note to come bail out Florida if something like that happens. They want Uncle Sam to commit the money now. Yeah, I talk about several points of what I call intelligent adaptation. And besides seeing the big picture and looking at geologic, you know, particular situations, I, I say that you need to realize that sooner or later, coastal properties will be known to be impermanent, that they, they have a life, not like land that's inland. We used to think that all land was permanent. Coastal land now, whether it lasts 50 years or 250 years, it's not permanent. That's a concept. The second one, to your point, is or the fifth point of my five is that you can't count on government bailouts for the long term because there is not enough money in the world to bail people out of sea level rise recovery because <coughs> you don't recover the land okay as opposed to storm recovery where you can recover the land and we haven't made that distinction yet i want to ask angela fritz uh, a, a secret question just between us uh, where should we buy land <laughs> not on the ocean front. Okay. All right. Well, I... Write that down. <laughs>